Today on the show, we have Penka Kunova. Um, she is an extraordinary Hollywood composer um, with experience in feature film, TV, video games, and virtual reality. Um, some of Penka's recent works have included Pandora, Encounter, Devil's Whisper, and games like Prince of Persia. Penka, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for the great honor. I'm really happy to be on your show. Yeah, you know, when I, this is the kind of interview that I feel like I could study you and like the things about you online for days before daring to have this conversation. Like, there are not a lot of women composers out there. Just a simple Google search, you know, I, for composers and film, and you get a list of like 30 men and two women. Well, you know, historically, composing has been one of these you know, man-only profession. That's just how historically it's been. And uh, especially in Hollywood, because we have a collaborative industry where the stakes are so high, you know, the investors invest their money. The most important decisions to make always are minimize the risk, minimize the risk. And that means hire people who have a proven track record and will be able to deliver without any problems, without any, you know, delays. So that's one, that's one of the big reasons why in Hollywood it's so difficult for women because the people who get hired are the people who tr with track record. So I always um, encourage my young friends or composers or student, um, you know, my, uh, assistants, I encourage them, work as much as you can, get many jobs, build your resume with a lot of, uh, jobs, mentors, people who can recommend you, because this matters the most, that you have jobs and people who recommend you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's start at the beginning for you. You grew up in Bulgaria, right? Um, I was born and raised in Bulgaria, yes. And your mom, wasn't she a professor of music theory? My mother, exactly. She taught music theory at the National Academy of Music. So I started piano when I was about five years old. And um, I really was fascinated by musical notation at the time and always by storytelling. I mean, ever since my childhood, stories have been this most important thing. Both my grand grandmothers and most of my mother were great storytellers. So we always would just be like listening to their stories that happened to them in their life. Uh, so I began writing out little pieces of music <laughs> like fish <laughs> or bunny. We had it an aquarium. So like tiny, but already at the age seven, I had this fascination with musical notation and with writing out the musical melodies. But uh, the pivotal moment happened when I was 12. My mother had had um, a director friend, actually producer friend, she was a producer in theater. She was creating these kids shows, like kids matinees, theatrical shows, and uh, that producer plugged me in because she thought it would be cute to have this girl pianist composer on stage. So like for a whole year on a Saturday, we would always have these matinees where she, you know, she's the actress, producer, and I played music on stage with my friends. So I was 12 and I began identifying myself as a composer. Um, and that's pretty early age to kind of really have yeah. found who you are. And then the rest was just, you know, I, Bulgaria was a communist country. Then the communism collapsed exactly when I was finishing the Academy of Music. And my parents told me, you know, look for opportunities to study abroad. English was the only language I sort of knew. And um, I started applying. I only actually applied to Duke University. This was like 1990. I got accepted in 1990 and came to Duke. Um, and the rest is history. I got master's and PhD at Duke. And um, one really wonderful thing happened. Duke did not have PhD, so they actually started the program. They launched the doctorate program as I was there. And I was the first, technically, the first student who got the PhD. So I was able to use, to leverage that big accomplishment to get a green card. Um, as an alien of extraordinary abilities, which back in 1995 was probably easier than it is now. And um, with that green card, I had the freedom to choose. And I chose to come to Hollywood, like so many people, driven by this dream and a sense of destiny. You know, I want to do this. I want to give it a try. I'm going to go to Hollywood. I only had one contact, um, Patrick Williams, the television composer whom I met at Duke. And just like so many people, I came to Hollywood just to pursue my dream of becoming a film composer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there is so much there that I, I just want to go back a little bit. When you said 
it was about the time of the fall of the Soviet oh, Union, right? Yeah. What was that? What drove your parents to recommend you to leave? Was it dangerous for you? Did they ever come with you? You know, what did that feel like? I um, so the year was nineteen eighty nine. That's when the Berlin Wall fell down. And uh, everybody knew this was the end of communism. And usually with these big social upheavals, there is a lot of chaos, which is actually how my application letter to Duke even got through the censorship of the mail. My parents um, always taught me to be very self-reliant, very independent, and always make good choices, and always be really responsible for my choices. I was not, like they were the total opposition of helicopter parents. They were kind of very, sort of let us, you know, be independent and self-reliant. And um, composing was already something I did and uh, something that I felt was my identity. And I kept composing. I had like a small body of work, you know, mostly instrumental classical pieces, a couple of songs. But one thing I needed to mention that's really important, when I was 17, that's even before the communism collapsed, my, my parents let me go to Japan all alone. Oh, by, by yourself? At 17. Oh, my because, gosh. Uh, there was a competition for songwriters in Tokyo. The year is 1984. And I wrote a song and the song got accepted. And I had to go and actually sing my song. <laughs> and I did. I spent a week in Tokyo. And uh, that, so my song got the Grand Prix, which was fantastic, you know. Uh, but what happened, that Japanese competition, um, I think is what, inspired the committee at Duke University to accept me because I already had that big award. Uh -huh. I didn't have any money. It's like, you know, this Bulgarian woman coming to America with no relatives, no money. How did you find out about the competition? Were you searching for one or did somebody so, recommend uh, it to you? In a little, couple of years before, like in 1989, there was another composer competition, which was, which was for women. It was sponsored by the International League of Women Composers. And um, I submitted one of my other, you know, piano pieces for that. And it got award again. And uh, the award was a small monetary award, but more importantly, being subscribed to the publication of American Music Center, which was this magazine with like typical reviews, interviews, and then opportunities. And on the back page of that opportunities list, I found about Duke University offering essentially a full ride um, scholarship and fellowship for masters in composition. That's how I found out through just that subscription to um, the magazine of International League of Women Composers. So this is one example where all these programs that are meant to support women and encourage women really changed my life in the most profound way mm -hmm. because found out about Duke. So I'm very um, proactive in, you know, helping women's events, like I was on the board of this organization, Alliance for Women Film Composers, because these organizations and for mentoring that doors get open for women to pursue their dreams. So that's how it happened. So being a theater composer, going to Japan at age 17 and winning that competition, and then... Um, Submitting my work a couple of years later, I was already at the conservatory at the, at the academy and receiving the publication that listed the opportunities, then applying to Duke and getting accepted at Duke and coming to America and immigrating forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. And it, that's it's just like such a big change, you know, especially in that time period. You just left your parents. How old were you? 23? Yeah, I was 23 when I left my parents, my home, my two sisters. They're now here. I brought them many years later. I brought them to America, so now we're together. Um, well, you know, I grew up in um, in communism, so there's this sort of theme, a dream, and always undercurrent, always in my mind, I was going to immigrate. I was going to at one point leave. You know how you kind of feel how your road is going to be in life? That's why my dad had me learn English. I kind of really sat down and learned English by myself with textbooks. And it was all about, you know, learning languages, learning music, studying, like being really prepared, at least prepared kind of in a nerdy sense, knowing things. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have much life experience when I left Bulgaria, but people understood um, I was really a hard worker, very hard worker. And um, I was always kind of full of creative ideas. 
also I was a really good collaborator because um, working in theater at the age of 12 taught me the importance of working with creative partners and understanding that music supports their vision and there's always something that's kind of more prominent than the music in theater, obviously. So that was a big experience to kind of have had already that collaborative training at, as I was in high school. I mean, I was like 12 or middle school and I was already working with creative people, mature, accomplished artists. Mm -hmm. So um, that was really important, these early collaborative, that kind of set me on the path of collaboration for the rest of my life. But uh, at Duke, I mean, at Duke, my professors were amazing, Stephen Jaffe and Scott Lindroth. They encouraged me to work in theater, to compose a lot of music, to get involved with like local ensembles and uh, got, get commissions. It was a very um, vibrant, amazing time in my life being a graduate student at Duke because I kind of got on this path of being very creative, being um, encouraged to try out things, to experiment, never be afraid. I mean, the whole attitude at Duke was sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. That's like the whole kind of vibe at the school. And um, I really sort of soaked that attitude of always trying different things, always essentially going on a path of self-determination, really sort of carving my own path, forging my own destiny, which is what happened for the rest of my life in Hollywood, which is a very difficult environment. Yeah. But uh, I would say Duke was this amazing, you know, seven years of my life doing the master's and the PhD between 1990 and 97. That set me on the, on the course for the rest of my life. That's amazing. And it, it, it's so different that, than some experiences uh, that I personally had, uh, if I could, if I may for just a moment, because I, I studied music in college as well, but I went to a very different university. Um, it was a private school and I loved my music theory class. I loved my teachers, but when it came to, okay, how are you going to support yourself for the rest of your life? And you're, I came to the teacher and said, you know, hey, is this a career that, you know, people should pursue? Is this a career that I should pursue? You know, I, I loved what I was doing. Um, and the advice that the teacher said was, and he gave it to the whole class, was good luck. You know, if you want to be a composer, good luck, because people don't make money off compositions until they're already dead and gone. Is that so, like, is that just wrong? Should people just never listen to somebody who says that to them? Because music is such a different industry, right, than a lot of other things. You know, um, I'll tell you something. There are two schools of thought. There are kind of two camps. The one camp is like the pessimists, realists, they say oh, it's really hard, which is the truth. And it's really difficult to make a living, which is also the truth. And, um, you know, it's kind of impractical. There's a gigantic competition. You're always competing for jobs. You're always getting rejected. So you hear these messages from a lot of people, from teach well-meaning teachers, well-meaning friends. That's the one school of thought, no, be a realistic, realize being an artist is a very difficult thing. Finances are always all over the place. I mean, I've been through such financial hardship even recently. That's the one school of thought. The other school of thought to which I belong, and that's how I train my assistants, mentees, anybody who's younger than me. I say, well, you know what? Pursue your dreams, follow your dreams. The universe has a way of throwing opportunities at you that you may not even realize exist. And then always work really hard always be really good with people, have a really solid work ethic. The universe is going to find a way to show you where you belong in life. And I totally believe in that. I absolutely believe that you can't say to somebody, no, don't do this. It's not a career. That is the truth. And I'm also really honest. I mean, I, I tend to be really honest. I, I say it's really difficult. You invest money. It's not like a career where you're going to start making tons of money right away. That's not how it works. You have to invest first. You invest your time. You invest your resources, you invest a lot of money, like all the computers that you see behind me, monitors and everything else. This is all bought on credit cards. So I would say, um, I just I just don't find it in my heart to say to somebody, oh, don't do it because it's just too hard. That's just not how I am. I would say, you know, recognize, you know, recognize how difficult it is, recognize how many years it's going to take for you to become masterful, to build your skills, to um, find your voice, to find your attitude as an artist, because that's really important. Mm -hmm. Recognize that you have to invest, it's like a lifetime, you invest your life into this career. But ultimately my message is follow your dreams, 
find where you belong, you know, forge a path and find where you really feel passionate and find the kind of people you really love working with, find the kind of projects you're really passionate about, you know, find your place in life. That's kind of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us have to find where they belong in life. So I'm of the school of thought who always says, you know, follow your dreams, work hard, make friendships, cultivate relationships, give to your community. I'm kind of more of an altruist, sort of positive. And to tell you the truth, I've met so many naysayers. Like when I had to make that move to Los Angeles, everybody's like, oh, you don't have a job. Don't go. You're going to, you know, you're going to waste your life. It takes two years to even get the, your first real job, which is the truth. Because for the first two years, you kind of, you work on jobs to pay the bills and you make relationships, cultivate friendships. So people were, I, I've encountered a lot of naysayers in my life and I kind of have probably promised in my heart not to be one of them. Mm -hmm. So my message is always recognize how challenging it is, but follow your dream and recognize opportunities when they open in front of your path and recognize the good people who will open these doors because that's how a creative career in the creative business is forged you know people open doors for you you forge friendships very deep friendships you stumble upon opportunities like the prime case for me is video games i was such a casual game like i would go to an arcade and maybe play some racing game and suddenly i became the composer of this gigantic iconic game franchise prince of persia because my mentor steve jablonski brought me on board and i thought to myself this is the lucky break this is the lucky bird that's landing on my shoulder. Everybody dreams of that lucky break. And I have to recognize, although I'm a casual gamer, I'm going to now sit down and educate myself about everything in video games. You know, franchises, technology, the history of technology, composers. I didn't know the composers. I'm going to sit down every night and like dedicate three, four hours of my time every night to study games so I become a real bona fide game composer and not some kind of flake intruder who kind of had one you know one hit wonder and i really did that and i forged a wonderful career in games but it was again that opportunity and then the commitment to learn the business so with my many many uh, assistants and mentees i just basically say you know study learn make friendships and recognize the opportunities mm -hmm. do you have a dog I have a dog. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I have a dog too. What kind of dog is he? Or she? It's a Chihuahua and she belongs to my daughter. And uh, getting a dog for my daughter is one of the best decisions, one of the best parenting decisions. We got oh. the dog when she was six. She's now 14. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so how did you personally find your voice in music beyond studying at a university where they teach you mostly all the laws, right? All the musical theory things. But when you're talking about relationships and in film and building themes that bring out like hidden emotions that aren't explicitly stated, you know, how do you find your voice and begin to build themes in that way? Well, that's, um, I've always been very passionate about science fiction, fantasy, um, because I grew up in a communist country, so sci-fi was gigantic. It was huge because it kind of gives you a way to present a fantasy narrative, but actually it's critical of the contemporary society. So it's like social critique packaged as fantasy. So I'm known, and that's part of my voice, and I really love it. I'm known as somebody who's like really well-versed in science fiction, horror, fantasy, the genre, and I get hired by my friends on these jobs, which is a lot of fun. So um, finding my own, I would say every artist, every person who embarks on a journey of becoming an artist has to find their attitude, you know, has to find what their contribution is going to be. Mm -hmm. and every day I ask myself, you know, what is the meaning of what I'm doing? Why am I doing this? Why, why does it matter? And these are questions that I've been asking myself every day since my Duke years. When I was a Duke, I kind of started writing my priorities. What really matters to me in life? I want to be a storyteller. I want to collaborate with people. I want to work in, in the industry where things are happening right now. I don't want to like, you know, sort of be stuck in the past. Like if I teach music history, I'll be teaching the same music that happened in the past. 
So I chose become, becoming a Hollywood composer by sheer kind of willpower. At the time, I didn't really think, you know, my vision for life. That, that, I didn't think about this. I was very intuitive, but I was driven to uh, work as a collaborative artist, work with other people, and uh, work in like fantasy, storytelling, genre, also drama. Um, the two fields I never had any interest in, I didn't explore, was animation. <laughs> I didn't grow up watching animation. Actually, right now I'm ex exploring and kind of discovering the power of animation because it's quite possible that for the next couple of years, animation and games will be the only thing that we make if all film production stops because mm -hmm. of the quarantine. So uh -huh. I'm kind of Covering. But the, how, how I found my voice, just many years of thinking, you know, what's the meaning of what I'm doing? Why am I doing it? How do I prioritize my core values? You know, what, how do I prioritize um, how I spend my time? Because time is the one thing that's finite, which kind of just goes. And yeah. my parents always taught me to value time and really kind of be very conscious where my time goes. So I wanted to speak about the five priorities. That's like 21 years ago when I first came to Hollywood. I just had the intuition. Nobody taught me business planning or, you know, business sense. But my intuition told me that at the time I had to focus on five things. Number one was earning money, doing jobs, just to pay the bills, to earn money so I stay alive and I stay in this town and build friendships. That was number one. How did you, you know, how did you do that? Did you get like a waitressing job? Like what did that look like? I was an orchestrator. I was an orchestrator on low budget horror films that needed like string effects and mostly were recording strings only. But I was making a living as an orchestrator. Okay. Um, and that that's a musical job which puts me in touch with talent of other composers who are ahead of me, who are more masterful, and I could learn from their mastery. So that was the first thing, just like earning a living as an orchestrator, as a music copyist. My second priority was to grow as a composer. My third priority always has been making friendships. I don't like the word networking because it's such a perfunctory concept, but making deep friendships, um, supporting my friends, showing up at their events, hosting parties. I cannot tell you how many parties we've hosted here in our humble home inviting people, whining and dining people. It's like building friendships, working on their jobs, being of service to my community because I intuitively felt it was the friendships. It was the friends that were going to open doors and give me opportunities. And that this is how I built my career because mostly in entertainment, everything is done through people opening doors to people they, they feel passionate about or talent they, they feel passionate about supporting. So number three was making friendships. Number four, here is where the research and learning happens and a very deep, like constant, you know, study of soundtracks, um, just kind of focused learning. And number five was just like, you know, stay healthy, exercise, uh, read books, um, replenish, that sort of, you know, be aware of what's happening, just, I guess, read, stay abreast of what's happening in the world. So um, I kind of figured out my own daily regimen because I've been now, now an independent artist out of school for 21 years. And uh, my time is all I have. The whole day belongs to me. Unless I'm working on a job for a client, then my time belongs to them. And um, one thing I needed to learn early on is to structure my time. But I would say um, just being really intuitive helped me understand that my biggest priorities always have been grow as an artist and make friendships and stay healthy and sane. Mm -hmm. Because this is a very long career. Um, you know, you have, to be, you have to be passionate. You have to be focused. You have to be committed for the long road. It's, I mean, it's been 21 years in Hollywood and I see myself working hopefully for the next 20 years because I still kind of feel I want to do things. I want to tell stories. I want to work on documentaries and um, it's, it's a very long marathon. And that's mm -hmm. how I, I say to everybody approach this as a marathon. It's a very, and this is why tenacity matters. You have to be super tenacious. Um, health matters because our health is everything and i mean both physical health and also mental you know attitudes 
um, friendships matter and friendships take a very long time to cultivate. You know, this is one town, Los Angeles is one town where sort of they're kind of so difficult to maintain and so difficult to cultivate. And so many relationships are kind of based around the job and when the job is over, everybody goes their way and nobody cares anymore. So there's like this really high degree of attrition in relationships, which means you have to always be making more friends, always be making more parties, inviting people, being of service to your community because friendships is your capital. I mean, friendships is really your most precious investment. Hmm. In, in a place where friendships are so valuable and so necessary, do you feel that it's harder to create genuine relationships? Because yeah. every, when everybody knows it's kind of like that currency. So how, how do you bridge that divide? How do you overcome that as an obstacle? Hollywood is one place where you give first before you can expect dividends, before you can expect people to give you something back. That, that, that's my experience, and it's kind of a unique experience, but I always felt like I had to work hard, help people. You know, when I get hired in a job, I do my best, I give my best, I give extra time, I kind of give extra of, of myself for the success of my client, kind of really being always very supportive, very encouraging to my clients, to my friends. Um, and, and people understood that I was a very hard worker, that I was kind of really giving to, give, uh, willing to give my all for their success. And that's, I mean, that's impressive. Also, people saw how I was really focused on developing my own skills, like always learning new skills. Just the fact that I started in film, then worked in television, this is like in the early 2000s, then this big game, a big door opened for video games, and I really learned everything from the ground up. And then virtual reality, then back to film. I've reinvented myself so many times, and each time when you reinvent yourself, when you pivot from one career to an adjacent career, there's so much learning that has yeah. to just, the learning is endless. So friendships have been the people who mentored me, and I briefly wanted to speak about three different kinds of mentors. You know, there's, a, there's somebody who's going to teach you things, kind of show you things. These are your tech buddies or your people who you learn from. But they may not necessarily be in a position to give you jobs, and they're still mentors because they're teaching you things. And then your clients, the people who hire you, they give you jobs, but they are so busy, they may not have time to teach you things. And, uh, but you're grateful for the job and you do your best and you learn from somebody else if you have to learn just to be able to do your very best on the job. So really, I would say, I mean, I've always been kind of a nerdy person who learns everything and that has helped me in this business. And then finally, you could have a mentor who's kind of more of a spiritual um, Sherpa type person who gives you attitudes, kind of change, changes your outlook on life, changes your outlook on your career, kind of brings out in you um, positivity or strength that you maybe you didn't think you had it but that person may not be able to give you jobs they kind of give you just wisdom that's also a mentor mm -hmm. so speaking about friendships every person who is my client mm -hmm. I consider also a mentor just by the virtue of them giving me a job I learned something profound from them and that process of learning is the most valuable thing it's what's inside my brain so um, building friendships really has been based on working very hard for many people, getting referred by them to other people, mostly building a network through work, through support. You know? And then once I kind of became more experienced, I began mentoring younger composers. And from the younger generation, I learned, again, I learned their taste, you know, what's kind of current right now, so I don't become obsolete, which is a big fear every artist has. You know, at what point do you become irrelevant because you're no longer in touch with what's happening right now? Thankfully, mm -hmm. I now have a daughter, she's 14, so through her, I kind of see, you know, their world, the world of that generation. So building friendships for me has been based on working really hard, on mentoring and giving back, on always being of help. Like if somebody asks me a question, I'll take the time to answer. Always be helpful to my community. And then the rest is just like, you know, we throw parties, we invite everybody, we wine and dine people really well because we live kind of far. So it's a bit of a drive. So if people drive, the food has to be really good. That's, that's financial investment and tremendous amount of work just to put on a big party. 
And we've been doing this for many, many years, my husband and I. My husband is a music um, editor. His name is Daniel Schweiger. Just like really kind of, and people come to our parties and they always say, oh, your friends are so wonderful and you throw the best parties and everybody's having a good time. And these are kind of the same, you know, people who are like us, very creative, very um, friendly, you know, very in, with interesting ideas, um, open, willing to discuss their ideas, maybe somewhat eccentric. But uh, also that's one way to make friendships. You know, you invite people, they bring their friends, you schmooze, you know, you just network, you meet people. I always give out CDs as a party favor, <laughs> my CDs. And because we live so far away, people kind of will be stuck listening in the car <laughs> on the way back. And, uh, and actually my husband gives out the CD. He's been very supportive, exceptionally supportive, especially in the way of giving my CDs to his friends. And uh, I would say building friendships is a long process. It has to happen organically. You can't force anybody to like you. You can't force anybody to trust you quickly. The trust has to be earned. And um, this is what I've done. Work hard, be of service to my community, throw parties, show up at every event I get invited to, especially like parties or events. It's difficult to speak about this right now in quarantine time, but I've always been very proactive in um, attending people's screenings, concerts, their own parties. I go to conventions. I used to go even more. Like I go to the Game Developers Conference, to Game Sound Con, to um, Society of Composers and Lyricists functions. There are all these organizations that are the leading organizations in the, in the industry. And they have conventions, and I go there, I see my friends, I keep in touch, you know, a lot of hard work. Make, making friendships is hard work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there are also transactional friendships. Now you help somebody, they pay you, you know, you work on a job, they pay you some money. These are kind of more transactional. But um, I would say creating deep friendships, genuine friendships, takes time. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to and you have to give a lot of your time and attention and care it's like watering a garden you know you have to nurture cultivate that relationship to turn into a real friendship yeah yeah and well it sounds like mentoring also brings in additional relationships that's mutually beneficial right so well, yeah. if somebody is maybe in the spot in their career that they're ready to be a mentor how how do you find mentees and like how do you kind of structure that relationship you know, people are always so hungry to build a community, to have a community. And I realize in hindsight, like one of the biggest impulses that has been a driving impulse in my life is to build a community. Because I grew up very lonely. In Bulgaria, I was always very lonely, like nerdy, weird composer kid. So um, on Facebook, for instance, for composers, there was this wonderful forum. It's called Perspective for Media Composers. It has like 10,000 people who are members of that Facebook group. It's so easy to find people who need some advice, some guidance, some help. It could be technical help. It could be more career help, like career questions. How do you, how do you figure, like, my, what is my path going to be? And uh, I, once I had my daughter in 2006, I quickly understood without helpers, I won't be able to survive. It's simply not possible to survive in this business without, like, a big team of helpers and that's around 2008 that's when I started building my my teams I was also very busy I always had to work much to pay the bills because I don't come from any financial stability at all so um, as I hired young people not only I paid them money for their work but also I had to teach them so much because they were kind of fresh out of school and they didn't know how the business actually works and the expectations and where the expectations are set so my job, I kind of took it upon myself to really train them and to bridge that gap between what they learned in school and the, the level that I was already working. You know, I worked on studio films, studio games, network TV shows as an orchestrator and as a composer. And um, I took the time to really train like three, four people and mentor them just how to work on these jobs together with me. And I always supervised their work. What were so, some of the, what were some of the biggest gaps that they had that school didn't teach them that you, you well, helped I, them through? I can't even begin to, Oh, that's, it's just, I mean, first of all, I mean, at the time, so the two main lines of my business and my career have been composing, scoring projects, 
with my own collaborators. In addition to that, orchestrating for other composers on their projects. So at the time when my daughter was born, I had to build a team of orchestrators because I was getting a lot of orchestration jobs because it's a good way to pay the bills. So um, I had to teach them, first of all, how to do the workflow. They didn't have any idea of the workflow because in school they hadn't experienced actual workflow. From the moment when you get the files from your client to the moment when you deliver um, the score, the completed score that's going to get played by 100 people and the session costs $50,000 because th that's how expensive it is to pay all these people in the studio and recording engineer. So I had to teach them workflow. I, th you know, they made mistakes. I had to kind of teach them what to watch for, what kind of to focus so not to not make mistakes. I supervised their work very closely. So um, my job was to teach them how to structure their time. For instance, I would say, this is going to take you probably 12 hours, plan your time. This is going to take you maybe six hours. I have to teach them time management, which I had learned in a line of fire by staying up all night. Mm. So I have a strict rule not to expect people to work past midnight because in our line of work, there is this culture of sleep deprivation and all-nighters, which is really bad because it destroys your health. And then in addition, I had to teach them like, you know, political savvy, you know, don't do stupid Facebook posts because I'm going to get really mad. Yeah. And it's, I'm going to get sued. I've signed NDA and you're posting about the jobs I gave you. Don't get pink and mad. That's rule number one. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the thing is just be savvy. You know, you're working in an industry. Everything is a industrial secret. Yeah. We work, especially in video games. I mean, there's a very strong, strict protocol of secrecy. So can you, can you even say that like you're working on a job? Is it just you're not no. supposed to say anything no. at all? No, you keep a secret until the job is, until the game is released uh -huh. worldwide. You know, then you can say, then you still have to ask permission. You know, can I talk about the game on Facebook that I worked on it? Everything has to be approved by the producer, by the legal department, by the owners of this intellectual property. Young people don't recognize, oh, I worked on this big job. No, you didn't work on the job. You're not supposed to say this on Facebook. So um, things like this, a lot of things, they, they needed. I mean, there's one period, my daughter was two years old. We just had started, I had just started building a team. I mean, all I did was type up these endless rivers of emails with instructions. It was a very intense training period. The couple of mentees that I had that now work at the studio level, I mean, I probably put them through a graduate school worth of learning on my jobs because I was really busy. So um, the learning kind of really encompasses everything, musical skills, technology skills, working with people with soft skills, um, political savvy, entrepreneurial savvy, and mm -hmm. um, they, they, each of my assistants worked for me for about three years, then kind of they went, went on to bigger projects on their own. Mm -hmm. But during the three years that they were with me, they got just such deep training. And um, it's good karma. It's something I kind of put out there, and now I'm getting good karma because I have all these. I've mentored over 50, like close to 60 young composers. And out of that number, one full quarter, like 25%, were women composers which is good and something I'm really proud of. And I kind of always um, pursued, I mean, I wanted to be sure I was mentoring women because that's just how you build the next generation mm -hmm. and how you change the percentages from like, you know, women scoring 2% or less than 2% of the studio projects to actually having more women who have the skill and the savvy and the attitudes to be a studio composer. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm very passionate about is working with the director because it's always their vision. You know, I work with their vision, with their ideas, with the script, then with the film. And people often ask me, you know, how do you collaborate? And um, th this is the workflow. This is the process that I go through. The most important thing is for me to um, understand their vision first. So it's a kind of a bird's eye view of the whole picture, the big gestalt, big picture. So we talk about ideas, the backstory, what's the story about, why it was important for them to write the story. And for instance, in the film Encounter, the director is Paul Solomov. He also wrote the script. And uh, it was important for him to tell a story of this group of friends. They're like kind of in their 40s, maybe late 30s, early 40s. Each person has something in their life that's off, that's kind of broken. And the whole journey of the film um, that they go on is that journey of healing and kind of becoming wholesome again.
Um, but what happens is they encounter um, this alien pod in a field and they take it home. And now they begin to, um, you know, show their attitudes and, and their, their feelings. Like for instance, some people tend to be more afraid of the unknown, other are more ready to embrace the unknown. And of course there's conflicts and there's dialogue and conflicts flare, you know, people, it's a very intense film. It's a good film. Really good. I highly recommend it. Encounter by Paul Salomon. So the first thing was just to talk about the story. The second part of the process is to talk about Paul's um, soundtrack, um, expectations in soundtrack and tastes in soundtracks. Um, most people who work in the sci-fi genre, you know, the whole geek culture, they are soundtrack collectors. That's part of that whole culture. So they have a very sophisticated taste in music and they're very articulate when they speak about music. And it's a fabulous thing. I love working with these people because with them, the conversation is very fluid. You know, what kind of music you like, you know, what do you like about this music? So we sort of, our job was to hone in on the tone. Again, overall tone, overall big gestalt, big picture. So he said, I want the movie to sound like Solaris. Solaris by, scored by Cliff Martinez. Um, you know, the movie by Soderbergh. So that's already that's kind of opening a door to go in one direction, which is awesome. I love it because I have a very clear picture in my mind, in my ear, what he expects. That's his taste, that's his expectation. He loves Solaris. My score is gonna be in that overall vein of the sound. And then um, the next step is let's talk about the characters. Every feature film has characters. Most of them will get some kind of a theme because that's how we remember them. That's how we remember who they are. The music gives that emotional depth, um, identity of the characters. So the next step, that's the third step, is to start thinking about the themes. And I, um, I wrote the themes even before he shot the film. He was actually shooting the film while I was, I was already working on the themes with that kind of sound that the music will be like Solaris, a little bit modern, a little bit subtle, expressive. And... Um, when he finished shooting, I presented maybe like six or seven themes, and he loved them. He just said, oh, this is awesome. This is really great. Exactly what I was hoping for. That's always wonderful. Not, not always I nail it, but when I do nail it, it's good. So once we have the themes, this is like the building blocks. I already have the building blocks. I have my ingredients. Now I have to <laughs> write 70 minutes of music to, to picture. After having the themes approved, is to um, create the list of cues, mm -hmm. which basically means to spot the film, uh, which means to select the times where music is going to come in and then come out. Obviously, we don't have music beginning through the end. Music comes in and then comes out. So um, and that's a kind of big decision to decide where music should go and where the dialogue has to be in the clear with no music at all. Usually music definitely has to play when there is no dialogue, but also under dialogue, we kind of have to give the emotional gravitas and underpinning, you know, undercurrent. So there's also music under dialogue. And once we have that list of cues, after we've done the spotting of the film, deciding where music is going to go, then my job is to sit down and start composing 60, 70, 80 minutes of music. Sometimes it's up to 80 minutes on these fantasy films. And uh, many composers maybe work in a sequential order, like from the first cue to the last cue. I don't work like that. I work first. This is like after I compose the themes. I work on a couple of scenes that have very strong um, emotional presence and also where the story pivots or gets propelled forward the rising tension and whatever it's called in the script. So I kind of select uh, the big musical moments because I want to figure out the big moments first. It's much easier to score these pivotal moments. You can think of them as tent poles of the film where the action gets propelled forward or there's a big reveal or the rising conflict starts because once you have scored these moments, then the rest of the score kind of writes itself because it's mm -hmm. all themes and variations of these moments. And um, so I don't work, like, usually the first act or the first reel, second reel, musically is kind of light. And I like to sort of sink my teeth right away into the big musical moments. 
because uh, we're still kind of figuring out the collaboration. I'm still figuring what my collaborator is going to like and resonate with. So it's really important for me to kind of do the big, substantial, important moments of the film first. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you hear it in your head before you put it on paper or before you put it into your software? Yeah. So this is also a process where every creator is very individual. And I encourage my mentees to always find their own process that works for them, that feels most organic for them, because people are different. Artists are different. And that's one very unique, very personal journey that we go on to find our best way of working. I tend to be very cerebral. I kind of spend a long time thinking about the music, about the themes. I think about ideas. I think about, I also listen, you know, to Solaris or whatever soundtrack we established as our model. So I tend to really think for a long time and kind of compose sketches. And the sketches are so kind of a shorthand, only I decipher them. But before I turn on the computer and open a blank sequencing file, which is always very intimidating, even to this day, I have sketches. So I would say my process overall is from the bigger picture, like from the bird's eye view picture to, to detail, you know, to more specific, more, you know, um, specific moments. Yeah. I'm curious, do you possibly have an example of what a sketch looks like? Just like a melody and chords. I, I totally have, in fact, I, I have one thing right here. Let me just show you. Yeah, can you, this is, it has one line, maybe a bass line and chords. It's very, it's very sketchy, or this one. It's like some kind of fragment of a melody. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So and, melody and, and chords, or this one, see, so says up-tempo, another sketch. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's really, really, really sketchy. I don't even care to, like, write, you know. But the whole point is that there's, like, a melodic fragment and an intention, there's a musical intention behind it. Maybe it's happy or maybe it's um, energetic or maybe it's sad. Um, because especially in feature films, you're telling a story and the emotions have to be very focused. They have to be kind of laser, laser focused and precise to embody the emotion with great precision. In both film scoring and game scoring, nothing is really kind of meandering or ambiguous. There's a certain amount of focus because you're honing in on that emotion that you're trying to express. So I would say probably I sort of oscillate between being very cerebral and also letting the music take me places and kind of surprise me with my musicality and experience. But um, I, I would say I tend to be the kind of composer who overthinks things, ideas, concepts, rather than the composer who sort of tinkers on the piano and plays vamps and kind of sees what is going to stick. I'm not this way. Maybe other people are. And because it's a very individual process, and I encourage my um, mentees to find the process that works the best for them. Mm -hmm. So you've got, your, you've got your sketch, and then you start, you build it. Then do you send it back to the director to get their opinion on it? What comes that's, next? The most, that's the most important part. Uh, usually they come to my studio for a couple of sessions and I also we swap files online all the time. So when they come to my studio, there's more opportunities to kind of talk about ideas, to hear their taste and, and play things for them and uh, let them respond right away. But also we swap files and they have the files so they can play it many times, kind of be alone, not be in a pressure, like in a playback meeting. And um, so as soon as I'm finished with like a bunch of cues, maybe like a whole reel worth of cues, you know, 20 minutes is a reel, then I send this, just the music dubbed to the picture with dialogue, and then I'm waiting for feedback. And some people prefer to call, other people prefer to um, email me. Email is better for me because I kind of have everything archived. And then I read the email, if I have questions, I call them. So there's a lot of back and forth, and it's a very dynamic process where my job is now to incorporate and implement all the feedback I'm getting. Sometimes um, the feedback is make this more intense. Other times is you now make it kind of less intense. Other times the feedback is let's just try something different here. Uh, for instance, you know, Paul, and again, I, I love working with articulate um, directors because they just have a way of articulating what they want, but it's not always the case. Sometimes I work with people who are inexperienced and I still have to kind of pluck the answers out of their mind and always be really calm, really respectful, kind of respect the fact that the directors are so inhibited 
about talking about music because it's such an abstract language. But um, most directors have a really good uh, way of communicating to actors. They talk about drama and emotions and emotional arc. And as a composer, sometimes I say, talk to me as if I'm an actor, you know, to talk to me about the drama or subtext or backstory or emotional arc or the emotional arc of this scene, but also let's just kind of see how that moment fits with the overall character arc, because most of these movies, the characters go on a journey. They, they have a character arc. That's a big part of scoring a feature film. So that relaxes the director, and then they start talking to me about motivation and backstory, because this is what they feel comfortable. They feel comfortable with concepts and stories and ideas. And my job as a composer is to distill that knowledge, kind of distill that sense, and turn it into music. Mm -hmm. I don't expect them to talk about, you know, D major, D minor, no, that's, that, that kind of makes them nervous. No, we talk about, you know, density and tempo and um, emotional arc. Where is the emotional arc going to peak? And dissipate. So the conversations about uh, with the directors are always about music as a storytelling device, not about you know clarinets or D major chords. Gotcha. It sounds like just describing it that way. It it's almost like you're a translator. You know, they don't have to worry about speaking to the language of music. You you understand both languages and do it yeah. for them. That's actually a very astute observation because as a composer for film, as a collaborative composer, collaborative composer, my number one job is to take their vision and translate it into music and uh, take the dramatic vision because, you know, it's all drama, it's all movies, it's sto storytelling, to take that storytelling and flesh it out with music that becomes the perfect match, just mm -hmm. like the perfect fit in terms of sound and arrangement and style. So it's, it's really fun. It's really difficult too. And you know, also I have to tell you something what's really humbling and kind of what keeps me on my toes. Every single project has similarities with past projects, but also every single project has its own challenges, kind of unique challenges. And part of my job is, number one, at the beginning is, especially if I work with a new collaborator, like right now I have all these new jobs, new people I haven't worked with, people who are not my friends. So my job is to understand how they work, what they resonate with, how they express their feedback. That's a big part of the job, kind of, and this is where people skills and soft skills are super vital, because as a composer, I kind of have to always be plucking out information from them, always asking for information. Is this working for you? Um, is the style and right now this this guy I just love him because he's like I love this is all awesome perfect awesome approved that's a good collaboration but not always I mean sometimes there are challenges sometimes they say well we want to kind of tip the scale more in the direction of this kind of sound other sound we want so we have to tip the scale which essentially means I have to change the arrangement and add more elements that belong in that style and take out other elements that belong from the different style. Right now there's a game, virtual reality game I'm working on, and uh, it's a happy collaboration, but they want me to revise, kind of to tip the scale in a different direction. It's my job to do it because I'm hired and this friend of mine recommended me and I have to make sure I do exactly what they want so the friend looks good. That sounds really hard. It's kind of like, it, like if, you, if you were a painter, and you were hired to paint this portrait and the, the person who hired you came in and said, no, I want it to look this way instead. And you paint over your original masterpiece and make it something else. That's exactly. Well, we work in a business with clients. We get hired by them. They have the budget. They have, it's their money. It's their vision. I learned this lesson from my first mentor, Patrick Williams, in the first week of my work with him, like my first week in Los Angeles. I'll never forget this lesson. He said, it's all about their vision. It's all about their money. It's all about their ideas. And you as a collaborative composer, harness your talent and harness your ideas. And it's all in support of the project. And the project always is the most important thing. So. It's, it's something I do all the time and I have to kind of really be very focused, listen really closely and always remember I'm working to support the vision and the ideas of my collaborators. They're paying me. Mm -hmm. My job is to deliver what they want and at the same time make it masterful, make it musical, make it expressive, make it unique. So that's the challenge to really uh, deliver what the people want, the clients want 
and make it as best musically as possible. That is the challenge of being a film composer. Well, let's say that in the process of working for them, you discover a masterpiece that they don't want. Can you then save that and implement it somewhere else in your career, or does it belong to them? All the time. I recycle, repurpose, reuse. I mean, first of all, I demo so much on jobs that never happen because somebody else gets hired. Everything I do that I feel strongly about, of course I repurpose repurpose it later nothing is ever wasted i mean especially right now because i work so much there's always some kind of a demo i worked on or some kind of project that didn't that didn't go that died and i recycle the music make it better reuse it i'm not concerned i'm not precious about my music because i'm always full of ideas and always full of kind of very you know uh, prolific i don't i mean my job is to give my clients the best i can my job is to support the film make it the best my intention is for the film to sell, for the soundtrack to sell, the film, uh, you know, it's always about elevating the production values, elevating the artistic value, you know, the music makes it unique, the music makes this project stand apart from thousands upon thousands of other similar projects. Mm -hmm. So I take very seriously the power of the music, but uh, I don't care, I don't, I'm not precious about the music, I'm about my own music, it has to be awesome, but yeah. it has to serve the project. You said the power of music, and I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that's a phrase that's used in the movie August Rush. Have you, have you seen it? There, it's about that kid who is orphaned, and he's, he's, about, he's all about music. He, there's, is he a savant? And he can, like, he can hear the fields of wheat swaying, and he can hear like everything translates as music to him. It, is that common in your field, to have that kind of connection with sound in the environment? That you're in? It does. You know, composers tend to be very, they're very sensitive to music and sound. The power of music is just immense because on one hand, it really gives you that emotional experience. It grounds the story into emotions and makes it powerful and you cry and you, and you laugh and you feel engaged. So just the emotional power is, there's nothing, no color, no story, there's no dialogue, nothing is as powerful emotionally as the music. But also music makes us remember, it yeah. makes us remember the gameplay or the movie, like think for a moment, think for a moment, you know, Star Wars, how that music makes you feel. This is a big, you know, epic story or, you know, uh, you know, Harry Potter, you know, that's fantasy and it lives in this kind of whimsical world. So you remember the whole experience by, by because of what the music was like. Mm -hmm. And this also has to do with branding, you know, the music really sort of, especially in games and virtual reality, music really becomes part of the brand, which kind of makes it similar to scoring jingles in TV, because it's all about the brand and finding that signature sound. And we talk about a lot about signature sound, because the music kind of has that power to make you remember, make you remember the experience and the title and the game. And mm -hmm. um, in film also, I mean, music makes you remember how it kind of made you feel when you watched that film. Yeah. So music is very powerful. And um, as a composer, it's humbling to realize the power that we have in our hands. And uh, if you can always approach the process with the intention of making it the best, then, then people resonate with that. And if the emotion is the precise emotion, and if you have that very big sweeping power, which that movie encounter has at the end. The last, the whole denouement, the last scene is really powerful, just riveting emotionally. And there's no dialogue. It's like, no, nobody, just zero dialogue. So the music is what propels that last act forward and the ending. It's really hard. It's not easy. It's very challenging. But uh, I, I picked this vocation or maybe it picked me. And now my job is to always deliver the most powerful score possible. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we kind of say goodbye? Oh, thank you for this amazing opportunity. I wanted to wish all the younger people, the younger generation watching the wonderful series, much success. Follow your dreams. Everything is possible. Just be really intuitive because sometimes an opportunity can present itself and um, you have to be able to recognize that moment. Make friendships all the time. That's the most important thing in any business, but especially in the creative business and entertainment business. And um, be ready for failure. Failure is really important because it teaches us important lessons. 
and uh, be ready for surprises that life gives you and the business gives you and always be open, open-minded, friendly, positive and ho I hope that all of your listeners will build amazing careers. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And this has been so informative. I think there's some th something for everyone to learn from, from what you've shared with us today, from all, from all angles of the film industry.